Hey everybody, how's it be? How's it go? Silverette here again with another Parkitect video. Now today I'm going to play Sheer Cliffs, which is not a scenario that I made, but it's a scenario that I really like because it's very similar to a roller coaster tycoon one scenario that some people might know, and it's just really fun. This scenario is well, at least was one of my favorites when I kind of play tested it a bit before the scenario pack came out. So let's see what this thing is actually like. The description says that these ancient cliffs were once a popular tourist destination, but now lie dormant. Work some amusement park charm into this small space and bring back the crowds. Now, if you look at the goals of this, they're not too intense. We just need to have 500 people in the park. Uh, but once you actually see the full extent of this map, you're going to see why this is such a challenge and why this is not nearly as easy as it seems because this map right here is super limited. Uh, at least we have one goal completed, which is to have no loan debts, but I'm probably going to uncomplete that goal at some point in this playthrough. Uh, but yeah, we just have very little available space, just a little bit of flat land above here and then some space at the bottom of this cliff to work with as well. We could also extend over here. Um, so clearly the main uh, challenge here is that the terrain is really difficult to work with and really limited. And I'm already wondering whether I actually want to build a path down here or whether I just want to keep everything much more simple. But I think I'm going to have to do that somehow. I think I'm somehow going to have to work some sort of path down these cliffs uh, and make sure that I can actually build some normal flat rides and stuff like that down here as well. But the main reason why I like this scenario so much, I think, is just that it's so much fun to try and come up with coaster layouts that make use of this really unique geography. Uh, in general, for me personally, having unique kinds of geographies and settings to build your own stuff in is one of my favorite things about playing scenarios uh, that even if, you know, it's not all about gameplay you sometimes have these really creative building elements that you can only get in scenario mode and you don't really get in playing sandbox and this is just one of them sometimes you get these really interesting limitations that force you to be a bit more creative in how you're building and these kinds of geographical challenges are just kind of my thing now i'm actually not really sure what we start out with here but yeah god that, that is limited oof so I think my first priority is actually going to be to start researching coasters because I'm not going to be okay with just this choice of rides. Now, I guess the thrill rides are also not too good, but I just really don't like the junior coaster and the wild mouse. So I'm going to start with that and then we'll see. I don't have too much scenery, so I think I'm going to keep that very simple. We'll see how uh, what else I can actually add to this map. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, now you already know that your boy is not going to be satisfied with a kitty coaster or some stupid wild mouse coaster, so I rolled the dice on the research department and they came up with an RMC Raptor, which is absolutely amazing. I love this coaster type, not just because it's really fun to build and it seems like a really cool ride in real life as well. For anybody who hasn't checked it out yet, I highly recommend checking out a POV of uh, Wonder Woman Lasso of Truth or Real Blazer at two Six Flags parks. I forgot exactly which ones, uh, but they're super cool coasters of this type that give a really cool example of what you can do with this. Uh, but yeah, it's not only a really cool coaster type realistically, I think, but in terms of gameplay, it's just so nice because you can build it really compact and it's just kind of fun to build. It just looks nice. I don't know. It, it's it's aesthetic. There's something about the look of this track that just makes it really easy to fit into different kinds of spaces. I'd say the only downside to it, of course, is that the uh, the throughput is absolutely horrible because you can only fit about eight people on a train, I think, at max. Uh, maybe you can make them a bit longer, but it's not, you know, uh, double seating as most roller coasters are. It's just a single line of trains with one person per car. So, it's highly inefficient, but it's still a good coaster that I think, especially at the start of a scenario, works out really well. Uh, because even though the throughput isn't the very best, you can still get a decent efficiency if you add a mid-course brake run and a brake run at the end of the ride. So yeah, you can have uh, three trains on it. Uh, and as long as you just fit in enough inversions and thrilling elements, you can even ask a quite terrible price for these things. Like usually, I think I raised the price to $12 or so, which given the actual amount of money that it takes to build these things, because they are also relatively cheap, 
is pretty good. So altogether, pretty cool coaster and I'm really glad I started out the scenario with this. The very idea for this layout was just to start the station at the top of the cliff and just use up all of that momentum uh, to make your way through the layout. Have a mid-course break run in the middle of the layout just to slow it down a little bit. The general area around the mid-course break run I'd say is very heavily inspired by the layout of Real Blazer, which also has that uh, same kind of turnaround element except without a break run. And yeah, just make your way back to the station with a lift hill at the end of the ride, which also makes it really efficient because uh, usually lift hills is kind of where the capacity of your coasters tend to uh, either be limited or where you tend to run into issues where uh, the coaster has to wait on top of the lift hill for the next train to clear the block. And you don't have either of these issues just rolling out of the station. Uh, and once you get back to the ride, you only need a very small amount of uh, lift hill uh, you, to you know, get back up to the station height. It's just really efficient to have a station at the top of the layout. I guess the only thing is that in a real life situation, I'm not a huge fan of having a station somewhere near the top of the layout because it means that you have the most boring part of the ride at the end of the ride as well. Uh, I remember, for instance, Ninja in Six Flags Magic Mountain is built like this, where you start off with a very small lift hill from the station, uh, you go through the entire layout, which is really fun, it's such a cool coaster, uh, but then at the end of it, you have this slow, boring lift hill back into the station, so... I do kind of prefer to have a lift hill at the start of a layout, so that it builds up the anticipation, and you don't have this boring, anticlimactic ending to a coaster, but from a gameplay perspective, I think it works out really well, and besides, uh, a drop out of the station is always really cool. There are very few coasters in the world which have a station at a higher altitude than the rest of their layout and have some kind of drop out of the station. Uh, I think the best one that I've personally been in was uh, probably Helix in Liseberg, which drops out of the station at quite a steep angle as well. Like, if you sit at the back of the car, you just get some airtime as you whip out of the station, which is absolutely amazing. Such a cool element. So, yeah, this is, for me at least, these are the kind of things that make building coasters in an interesting geographical location, like this cliff, so interesting, because you can play with these layout elements that you normally don't see unless the coaster is based in some kind of unique geography. Now, with uh, the coaster, I'm sort of suspending the station above the cliff, which makes it possible to drop straight out of the station, but not waste too much valuable land space, because you do see that, you know, the amount of actual flat land that I have on top of these cliffs is very limited. So I wanted to suspend the station off of that so I can have a wide path and not make this whole park seem too crammed. And then I ended up doing the same with this flat ride here, just because I think it looks really cool. I think in real life this is uh, probably a no-go because flat rides need some kind of foundations and supporting uh, that probably wouldn't work like this. I, I really wouldn't see the point of suspending any kind of ride off the edge of a cliff. Even with real life rides that sort of are built on cliffs, they'll always be built on the cliff and then have the actual ride sort of extend over it. I think a good example is probably the Stratosphere Tower in Las Vegas, where there are flat rides on top of a giant tower, but then the actual foundation structures are still uh, very firmly nudged in the middle of the tower and not sort of overhanging it. But yeah, uh, I, uh, I thought it would just look cool on Parkitect, so I'm going with that. There's also a small path leading down the cliffs, because I do want to expand the park a bit down there. I don't think it would be doable to build this whole park uh, on top of the cliff and beside. I just really like the uh, idea of having this winding pathway that narrowly climbs up and down the cliff. I'm not sure how much the guests are going to like it because I think they're probably going to get very tired once they have to climb up this thing, uh, but it looks cool, so I'm going with it. Now the rest of this uh, park I actually kind of want to theme almost as if it were a beachside resort, which is a bit strange I guess because in this, uh, this context, the, the beachside apartments and hotels and uh, beach houses and things like this that you would normally see at a beach resort are perched on top of the rocks instead of actually being at the beach. But I, I just think it looks really cool. It's the most fitting theme that I could really come up with that fits the beach theme and also works with the entrance building because uh, the entrance building is something that 
I can't help but keep because you can't remove it. So I want to try and fit all of the other buildings as much into that style as possible while also having as much variation in the types of buildings as well. So I figured within that whole context, uh, I think the, the theme of having some sort of beach resort uh, works best. And to establish that theme, I figured that nothing works better than a big apartment building, which I guess here would probably be a hotel. I think this would work quite well as a small kind of themed hotel building. Kind of modern architecture, much more new than the other buildings, but you know, uh, at this size, you can't just make a building that looks like a tiki hut and is built out of logs and thatch roofs. So I think it works like this. Uh, it's also probably the best place to put this building because it's right in front of a section of the cliff where there's no building uh, in front of it. You don't have the coaster station or a flat ride in front of it. So whoever has to, you know, pay up for how extremely expensive the rooms with those balconies probably are, they're gonna have a really cool view of the sea as well. And next to that, it's time for a, a food court of some sort, I figured. So this is going to be my food building. Very simple, there's not really going to be much to it, but it helps to cover up the area behind these two buildings, which is going to be the, the backstage kind of section. And I believe between these two buildings, I just built a very small alleyway that allows the staff uh, to get to the backside. Now at this point, I was actually struggling because I realized looking at my research for stalls, which I forgot to look into earlier, uh, I actually didn't have much to work with. Um, so I had to do some research real quick and actually get some stalls. Ended up getting burgers, which is fine, and hot drinks, which is absolutely the worst thing ever because this is already a super tropical park. But I think the guests are not going to complain about that, so ended up just putting down the hot drinks. I actually have to correct myself here. This little building, this newest one, is actually the food courts, and the other building is where I put some other stuff. Um, actually, did I even put anything in that? Yeah, I think I put the vending machine there, so that was sort of my first real food court, uh, because before I had the stalls, I just had a vending machine, so people could buy cans and chips, which is... Kind of terrible, but at least it's some food and drinks. And then once I actually got the research, I built the new proper uh, food market. Whatever the case, we've got some rides, we've got some buildings, we've got the basic facilities in place. I'm really happy that the entrance building already has a toilet and an information kiosk in it. That makes my job a little bit easier. And yeah, next to that, I decided to just build a topspin because it's just about the only ride that I could feasibly fit into a space on this map. Uh, but I think it works decently well. And even if you're in the top spin, you do have that view down the cliff, which is really cool. Probably one of the coolest settings for a top spin. The only reason I decided not to put it over the cliff and actually have it uh, behind the path is because I needed some space to build the station for this Gerslauer Eurofighter, which I'm building right now. And I just, this is another one of my favorite coaster types. You're probably noticing at this point that I build a lot of Eurofighters and monorail coasters in my scenario builds because they're just such cool coasters. They work really well together. Um, and yeah, they're just fun to build. Eurofighters, just like monorail coasters, are not the most efficient coasters when it comes to throughput. So I am gonna feature some mid-course brake run action on this coaster as well. I'm gonna have to very carefully see how I'm going to distribute the trains on this thing. But altogether, I think it works decent in this setting. And the cool thing is also that you don't even have to do the vertical lift hill at the start of the layout. I'm just dropping straight from the, uh, from the station into that vertical drop down the cliff, which is pretty cool. Uh, I would love to see a coaster, like an actual Eurofighter do this. Maybe an infinity coaster or whatever kind of coaster. Having a station on top of a cliff and then just dropping down from that is super cool. Um, and then the rest of the layout is just more or less sort of standard Eurofighter fare. Uh, it's not too interesting, but as you might notice, there aren't very long stretches of track without a brake run. From the first drop, uh, you just have a vertical loop and then an overbank turn straight into a mid-course brake run, after which we just have some turns, a corkscrew and a helix. And then it's already back into the station. So it's a very simple layout with lots of brake runs actions because even before the lift hill back into the station, there's another brake run just to make sure that I can 
constantly rotate through these trains and just have the maximum capacity. Uh, that's the same reason that I'm creating the double station here, which I think for a Eurofighter works better than any other kind of coaster because you really don't need a lot of space to build a double station for a Eurofighter because these trains are just so small. Uh, theoretically, you could even do it with stations that are one tile long, um, but I just don't like the look of that. I don't think it really looks realistic. In real life, you do find load and unload stations for Eurofighters, but they're usually a bit longer than just the length of the Eurofighter cars. So uh, I think this is a way to find a good balance between realism and um, in-game gameplay and efficiency. And as you can see, while I'm testing this thing, I'm running three trains and the brake run at the end kind of allows this coaster to run four trains, I think, uh, theoretically, but it's not really necessary. You've always got one train uh, loading and then another train unloading directly behind that as it leaves the station. So as you can see, it just keeps going and I think it's probably about as efficient as this thing needs to be. And besides, these are actually slightly more efficient, I would say, than the monorail coaster, because even though the trains are very short, they are four rows wide, so you can still fit eight people per train. So 24 people can be on this coaster at a time, and they're rotating like every 20 or 30 seconds or so. So it's still a really good throughput. Like, I, I find that it really helps to go into the results of the coaster and not necessarily, you know, check the data of excitement, intensity and that kind of stuff. Uh, even though that's also really important, but I think it's, al it's always important to note how many people can ride the coaster uh, per hour at max and then see, you know, how much money can you ask them to ride this coaster and then see how much profit am I going to make off of this coaster when it's running at its best, which it usually isn't because every now and then it rains or uh, you just don't fill the entire queue. Uh, but for this Eurofighter, I think it went over one and a half thousand dollars. So that's really good. So I decided to just leave it as this. It's uh, about as efficient as you can reasonably make a somewhat realistic Eurofighter layout in this game, I think. And then for everything else, I'm just making this very similar actually to the station of the monorail coaster, just with a different roof color and kind of playing with the queue there a bit, making this kind of uh, green roof on top of a wooden structure to cover the queue line. I also put a lot of trees into the, the cliff face, as you might see, uh, which are actually sakura trees. They're actually the cherry blossom trees, but if you make them green and sink them into rock work and combine them with palm trees and things like this, I think they make for some really good tropical shrubbery. Uh, so you can put, you can see me putting those trees everywhere. Uh, another thing that you might have noticed is that I'm using those trees to get rid of supports, because if it weren't for those trees, uh, there would be supports underneath the station of the monorail coaster and underneath the uh, flat ride, which is suspended off the side of the cliff. And I didn't want to have those supports, I wanted to make my own custom ones. So I used a bunch of trees underneath it to remove the supports. So just a little tip, sometimes if you want to get rid of supports of coasters, you can put a bunch of shrubbery underneath it. And as long as you're using trees that are sunken into the ground to make those shrubs, uh, then the supports are going to disappear. And that can be pretty handy. Now my final ride... Oh, whoa, my chair is being really loud. I hope you didn't hear that. Probably did. My my final ride of this uh, episode is going to be a junior coaster, which I've also built so many of. So I'm really trying my hardest to come up with new layouts for these things as well. Uh, it's not always easy because I've kind of done everything at this point. But I think this layout manages to do something new and also explore this little island, which I just bought, by the way. This is not something that you get with the scenario, but you can buy it for what, like $10,000 or something like that. It's not the cheapest thing, uh, but with the monorail coaster and the Eurofighter, the money was already flowing in like crazy. So I felt pretty uh, confident to just infinitely spend money on whatever I wanted to, because as you can see, I'm earning like over 2000 a month. So that's more than good enough. And I'm not really going to add too much to this island. Otherwise, I'm going to keep it quite simple. Um, but I think it's a, it's a nice way to finish the scenario and actually make use of all of the land that's available to me and not just keep everything uh, on top and around of those cliffs. Now, as for the theme of this, 
I actually don't quite know what the general area of this general build would be. It's very generic, kind of tropical. Uh, it could probably be somewhere in South America, but just as well be on a tropical island somewhere. Uh, or maybe even be Mediterranean, if you could even find cliffs like this anywhere in the Mediterranean. I'm really not sure, uh, but I think it works alright, because even in uh, some tropical regions in the world and South America, you do find a lot of Mediterranean influences in architecture. So this is the general theme that I'm going for, I would say. And because this is a, a nautical theme, and we do have the ocean here, presumably, I'm just assuming that this is probably the ocean and we just are building on some sandbanks here. I wanted to build a little lighthouse over here as well. And this is really a lighthouse lighthouse because it's not just a tower. I'm also attaching a little house to it and just going for this generic kind of Mediterranean stucco architecture. It's very difficult to create very specific themes in this game because everything is just so basic that I think it's more about the vibe that you're getting from any particular building as opposed to details. Uh, because even when it comes to distinguishing between different styles of Roman architecture or other classical architecture, or maybe even Egyptian or things like this, there isn't that much that you can create in terms of differences. It's all just more about general appearance and colors and how everything comes together. So... Um, yeah, it's hard to say that there's anything particular about this build. I would, I just loved the way that this looked, uh, having this little house on the rocks and just putting a bunch of palm trees and ferns and bushes around it and having a bit of interaction with the coaster as well. I think it's a lot more interesting than just leaving this whole area bare. And then I'm also creating a very small path leading up to the lighthouse from the real path, which of course people aren't going to be able to walk. Uh, but I think it adds a little bit of theming to the entire... Uh, look of this. Another thing that I ended up adding is some grass patches here and there, which I think kind of resembles the, the helm grass that you find in sand dunes. Of course, the grass isn't really meant for this. Normally, I find that I really don't use that much grass because it's just very heavy on your CPU and it's really tall. Uh, I'm honestly fine with just leaving all of the grass in my scenario playthroughs uh, completely empty. Uh, but for a case like this, I think the grass patches really pop out and create this sort of sand dune look. So I it was kind of an accident. I was just wondering, you know, what kind of shrubbery I could put on the beach because I wanted to have some ground shrubbery, but of course not too much because it is a, a beach after all and it is just sand. Uh, but I think this works out really well. And it's definitely something that I want to remember for in the future in case I ever do any more desert scenarios or things like this because this just works out pretty well. And then when it comes to the station of this coaster, again, very similar kind of architecture. I'm just using uh, some of the round uh, pillars from the castle set, which are supposed to be stone pillars, but just giving them a wooden color makes them kind of look like really dark wooden logs. And then using the border pieces, which have those little ends, which I'm actually not sure what they're supposed to be used for, uh, could be for doorways or things like this. Um, but yeah, I like to use those at the end of the pillars uh, to make them resemble the, the fact that these logs in real life sort of go into each other and... Uh, I don't know, it's, it's, a really, it's really difficult to describe it, but in real life logs, you know, in this kind of architecture don't perfectly just attach to one another and you'll often see them uh, either roped to different uh, logs so they don't use nails or anything like this so you can always have parts of logs sticking out uh, so using some of those little pieces and making the pillars a little bit higher than the horizontal logs are uh, really creates the same kind of look even if we can't make these roped together uh, log structures in this game because that's just too fine a level of detail so yeah that's basically it for the station and then I decided to add one more flat ride over here because I got it, which is the pirate ship, which I think works out really well with the theme and especially this part of the park being a bit more ocean themed than the rest of the park is. And with just a small pier and a small pavilion with some benches to sit down at, that is basically the scenario finished. So I didn't even do a real time section in the middle of this time lapse because I was just on a roll and I just wanted to keep going. And all in all, this turned out to be one of the quickest scenarios 
that I've done, uh, but really fun. I really enjoy trying to work with the uh, interesting geographical challenges and building some coasters on the cliffs is just really cool. So one of my favorite scenarios, at least the playthrough so far, I'd say. And uh, let's take a final look at the at our final product and see what it's like. So the goal of this scenario is to reach 500 guests and we're currently at 489. So if my math serves me right, that means we're actually only nine people, actually only seven people until we reach the 500. I think it'll be fine. There's a <laughs> there's a downward arrow here for some reason, but honestly looking at these crowds, I'm not really sure if I believe that. Anyway, I guess this is probably going to be Okay, no, never mind. We just completed the goal, so we don't actually have to wait a couple of months until we actually reach it. So um yeah, that's the scenario. This was quite a short one, but um I had fun. Let's move on to the next video. Now I'm just kidding. Um, I'm gonna do a quick POV of some of the coasters out here because I think the layouts are pretty interesting and it'll be nice to go over some of the scenery. But to be honest, this was a pretty short and simple scenario at the end of the day. So obviously we have the uh, RMC Raptor coaster over here, which honestly, I just, I can never get enough of these things. I know I've said this so many times before, but these things are just so fun to build. And they're always much better in terms of capacity than you would think, especially if you add a couple of mid-course brake runs. And they just look so good. I just love the way that the track kind of flows as a ribbon. So I try to uh, preserve that look in this layout as well and just make it this kind of ribbon-like layout flowing next to the, uh, the cliff sides here. And basically just after a couple of very standard elements, we go into this really strange final inversion into the lift hill. I just love coasters that end with the lift hill. Uh, it's not great for a climax, but it is very satisfying to not have to waste any uh, kinetic energy on the ride. So after that, we can move to the Eurofighter, which does basically the same thing. Actually, let's just catch a quick POV on this one. <laughs> and I still like how this layout is kind of standard fare for a Eurofighter. It's a bit more sprawled out. Especially around this area, you can see it's kind of unusual with the mid-course brake run as well. Uh, but otherwise, it uses some very standard elements for a Eurofighter just with the station at the top of the layout rather than at the bottom of it. And again, I think the emphasis on efficiency and throughput for both of these coasters uh, was pretty good because I do have quite a queue for this one and I'm really trying to get as much capacity from this thing as I can. Um, but looking at it, the theoretical amount of customers per month is 132, which is not too bad in Parkitect. And the max theoretical earnings are also um, 1,500 something, or at least uh, that's what it's at right now, which honestly is pretty good, I'd say. So finally, of course, we have the Junior Coaster and I also have to say, I think this is my favorite ride in the park, or in general, my favorite area. It's the one that feels most coherent, kind of like the most recent expansion to the park. And even though it's very simple and only features these two rides, and I need to <laughs> probably fix up the timing on the block brakes, actually, looking at this. Um, I just like the way that it all fits together. Um, and the color scheme, too. I feel like the uh, orange-purple color scheme is a bit underrated and underused. It does feel a little bit Nickelodeon and I guess it's a color scheme that you can usually find in kiddie areas of theme parks uh, but I think it works and it's a nice bright color scheme that especially in a, a tropical setting like this one I think looks pretty fun. Um, I guess I can't actually do anything about those block sections it's just it has to be that way that's just kind of how the layout works. To be fair the fact that I added a block section at the end of what is essentially a kiddie coaster is already kind of setting this thing apart, so I think it's fine. But yeah, all in all, it's a very simple, short, sweet scenario. I really like how this sort of outcrop with the junior coaster worked out with the uh, lighthouse, especially because I just really wanted to add some variety to my lighthouse architecture. I've built so many red white black lighthouses in this game that I figured it would be nice to try my hand at something else and I'm keeping everything very simple it's not too detailed but 
I do like the combination of the different colors and materials and stuff. And then the top over here is just kind of a mis a mishmash of like different kinds of beach boulevard architecture, which is still kind of strange because technically it looks like a beach boulevard, but then the actual beach is down here. It's like they just raised an entire boulevard up, uh, <laughs> including some of the, the bars that you'd normally find at a beach because I feel like especially the building on top of the scrambled eggs here kind of has that beach bar architecture except on like stilts basically um but yeah all things considered i'm pretty happy with this scenario and the fact that i managed to somehow at least bridge the the lower section of the park uh with the higher section up here so yeah let's not uh say too many words about it anymore i'm just gonna save the park here and let's move on to the main menu and see actually what the uh the final little building is that we get put on the map honestly i'm not really sure but i guess it's yeah it's just the entrance building that makes sense all right so that's it for sheer cliffs and that means that we get the final island which is going to be over here the haunted island which is where the very last scenario of the game is located but i have to say before I move on to that, I really have to do Robo Park. So next episode is going to be all about Robo Park. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you in the next video. Let's get going.